say Merry Christmas still? Merry Christmas. <laughs> yeah, every day is Christmas. Because we love Jesus. All right, if you want to stand up, we're going to get started this morning um, with a word of prayer. Uh, Father God, we just thank you for how awesome you are. Uh, God, we recognize that, um, God, you created everything, you put everything in motion, and you're still in control of everything. Um, God, so we hand over um, our, our joys, we hand over our sorrows, we hand over our troubles. Um, God, we take on your burden because it's light and easy for us. Um, God, we, we thank you for your son Jesus who made it light, who made it easy. Um, God, help us to push forward in this world and, and push your name out there into the our, our neighborhoods and our communities. And um, God, we just need to introduce people to you because you're incredible and you're loving and you're gracious and you're merciful and you want to just spend eternity with us um, for some reason. Um, God, um, you just you just love us so much, and, and God, we just thank you so much for that. Um, God, we pray this all in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.
and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I called to the Lord who is worthy of praise, and I have been saved from my enemies. Thank you. 
Christmas plus one day, everyone. Christmas is the time of multiple things to celebrate, including the birth of Christ, Santa coming down the chimney, and family. We are so happy about Christmas, there's no other holiday that gets as much praise and decorations as Christmas. And it is the most celebrated holiday as well, and I'm fairly certain almost everyone here is their favorite holiday. I am disappointed to say that today is the day after Christmas, and I'm fairly certain all of you are also wanting to say that. Don't we all wish Christmas could last at least one more day? We always want good things to last longer than they are. If we want things to last longer, all we have to do is just act like it. I think we've all had a moment where we felt more connected to Christ than ever. If we act like that every day, we'll feel that connection more and more. It's like the saying, treat every day like, it, like it's your last. Instead, treat every day like you're with God. If we do this, we'll always feel the love he gives us to every day. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you for bringing us here today. We thank you for being the light in our lives. And we are so happy that we could celebrate your birth again this year. And we will continue to for all of eternity. We love you, God, and it's in your son's name we pray. Amen.
morning, everyone. There is no junior church today, so kids, don't forget a kid's bulletin in the back. And if you fill that out, we'll give you a piece of candy for paying attention. Um, as Brendan said, today is the day after Christmas. It doesn't get as much publicity as the Friday after Thanksgiving. And uh, how many of you are just kind of worn out from all the festivities? Yeah. Like, I, I'll tell you, I woke up, walked across the room, because we keep our alarm clock on the other side just so that I don't hit it and go back to sleep. But I went across the room, shut it off, and I headed back to bed. I was going back to bed, got halfway there, and I was like, oh, it's Sunday, i got to work. And so I turned around, I am tired. But through all that, there was a bunch of excitement that kind of generates excitement in us. There's people who are just talking about all their gifts. We have one lady in the back who a special visitor came to see her on a very loud Harley, and you'll just have to go ask her about that. And, um, there are people who got these really great gifts. There's somebody who got something very shiny. Um, I got new socks, and those are awesome, okay? And so with all that, I want you to grab the excitement that you had all that. And even though today is Sunday and we're all tired from the past festive um, festivities, as you can tell, I can't even talk, I'm tired. And let's hold on to that as we look into this, because this whole year, our theme for this year has been destination. All year long, we've looked through the book of Acts, and at times we went into great detail all to help us see where God was leading us individually and corporately as a church. Through all this book, we've seen the church do some incredible things, incredible kingdom growth. But there's something else in this book. We have spent this whole year going through this book for this sermon. This is the one I couldn't wait to do, but we had to get through all of it to get to this one. There's an underlying message all throughout the book of Acts. Um, and so today we're going to unwrap Acts. We're going to unwrap it and see something a little bit more. To do that, let's just go over real quick what we saw. Acts was written around 62 or 63 A.D., and the author is Luke, the same one who wrote the, the Gospel of Luke. Uh, it covers the first 30 years of Christianity and is the bridge story between Jesus and the church of the New Testament. To get to our destination, yesterday we, we ended up going up to Michigan to see my family for that Christmas, and we need to know where we're going. I couldn't just turn south on 69. I had to know where I was going so I could turn the right direction so we could get there. Our destination as Christians, should always be a get closer with God, to have a greater and deeper faith, and to share that and help others come to know Jesus as their Savior. We want that as our destination. But how do we get there? How is it that we can get closer to God? How is it that we can grow deeper and stronger in faith? How is it that we can invite other people, introduce other people so they can also choose Jesus as their Savior? Well, the book of Acts has shown us. What we saw as we traveled through the book of Acts is going to show us that vessel by which we will get to our destination. So what did we learn? We saw in the beginning, uh, the first part of the book in Acts 2, verses 2 and 3, suddenly there was a sound from heaven like a roaring mighty windstorm. And it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each one of them. And after this, the apostles went out and they started preaching and teaching about Jesus the Messiah. And after that sermon, look what happened in verse 41. Those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day about 3,000 in all. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings, to fellowship, to sharing of meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. The church was officially born. Peter was primary in that sermon. Just six weeks primary to preaching this, he was the one who betrayed Jesus. In six weeks, he went from denying he even knew Jesus to publicly proclaiming Jesus is the only way. He is standing before 3,000 plus people teaching this. This is a dramatic change in Peter. 
Peter changed his direction because he finally saw his destination. And this is very critical. We all need to know this, that we can change our destination our direction if we know our destination. Peter went from denying to declaring. And because of Peter, he is now focused on his real destination. Peter's going to end up dominating the first 12 chapters of the book of Acts. In the temple, a lame man asked Peter and John for a donation. And, and Peter, I, I imagine he pulls out the pockets of his robes and says, I, I don't have silver or gold, but what I do have, I will give you. In the name of the Jesus Christ. Look what it says, verse three, uh, chapter 3, verse 6. I don't have any silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I have in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazarene. Get up and walk. Immediately the man's feet and ankles became strong, and he began to not just walk, but leap around, and a crowd began to gather. His sermon stirs the people, and some believe, some believe and some go into anger. The sermon ends up landing Peter and John in prison, but look what happened. Look what happens to the church after they are thrown in prison. Verse 4, But many of the people who heard their message believed, so the number of men who believed now totaled about 5,000. We just heard 3,000 were baptized. Now just the men are numbering in 5,000. It started in an upper room with a few hundred people, maybe. We, got, we know the 12 were there, but there were other people there, so maybe 120. And then it jumped to 3,000. Now it's blown up to 5,000. Now, that's, that's real growth. I want to see that happen today here. Okay? And remember, Luke is a physician who is very intentional with his word choices. If you turn the page into chapter 5, verse 14... And more than ever, and more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. We have 12 disciples who are going around, then they meet in the upper room, and then all of a sudden they go out into the street and they start preaching and teaching, and 3,000 are saved. And then a few, the next chapter, 5,000 just men. Now Luke, a physician, a trained guy who knows how to count and knows how to use words, he says, multitudes. He's beyond trying to keep count. Why? Why has the church grown in such a way? There, there's a lot of ideas as to why the early church grew so rapidly. The truth is, the church here in Acts was on destination. They were focused on growing in faith, growing deeper in faith. They were focused on growing closer to God and helping other people come to know Jesus as their Savior. The apostles, the first elders, were doing their God-given roles in the church. They were preaching and teaching the message of Christ. The, the elders were leading and caring for the members of the church. And in turn, <clears throat> the rest of the church was living out their faith daily. It means daily they were living it out, talking about their faith. How did the church stay on destination? The elders led spiritually while the congregation lived out their faith. So the elders were making sure everything happening here is right and, and godly and spiritual so that they, everybody in here can go out and do what they need to do. We saw that as the church grew in numbers, many problems started coming. There were people who tried to swindle their way into being honored. There were people who felt that they were not being taken care of properly. In chapter 6, um, the help of the growing church pains just starts groaning in the church this way. And the elders select seven men, or deacons. And through looking at scriptures, we saw that deacons are servants. Their, uh, their responsibility is to handle different areas of ministry so the elders can stay focused on their job of preaching, teaching, praying, and leading the church. Deacons are not pre-elders. They're not elders in training. They are individuals who have some sort of responsibility so that the elders can focus on their real role. And as a result, the church doing this stayed on destination. Look what happened in verse six, or verse 7 of chapter 6. So the message continued to spread. The number of believers greatly increased in Jerusalem, and many of the Jewish priests were converted too. We had multitudes in chapter 5. Now it's greatly increased. How can you go from... 3,000 to 5,000 to multitudes to greatly increased. 
Luke is precise with his numbers. And so we know this is intentionally, he can't count this high. When the church stays on destination, the church will grow spiritually, which always leads to numerical growth. A healthy church always grows numerically. It's all through the book of the Bible. A healthy church keeps growing. I've heard some people proclaim small churches are the best. They're the most godly, the most spiritual, where you can know everybody's names, where you can be involved with so many people. I've heard some people proclaim when you preach, this this guy actually told me this, when you preach the message right, people are going to leave the church. Well, then you didn't preach it right. Because here in the beginning of the church, when they preached the message, people came and kept coming. We had 3,000, 5,000 multitudes and now greatly increased. A church on destination will grow both spiritually first and numerically. Now, let me just say something. You can grow a church numerically, not as a result of spiritually. You can. We can do a lot of cool things to just make people want to come here. That isn't our goal. Our goal. That's not our destination. I, will, I do want to say one thing. I, I agree. Serving with people in a small church is easier. It feels more family-like. We, we know each other's name. But it doesn't mean that's always the way it was destined or designed to be. Being on destination is not about where we are now, but where we're heading. We need to make sure we're focused on the real destination. Let me ask you a question. How many people do you want in heaven? How many want ten? That's all you want. We, we have 160 on average here. How many of us just want 160? How many of you want more? See, if you want a small church, or do you want a huge heaven? It's not focused on here, it's focused on there. That's where our destination needs to be. If we want a heaven that is full of people, we better be a church that's on destination of growing in faith, growing closer to God, a stronger and deeper faith, and helping other people come to know Jesus as their Savior. A church that is growing spiritually will grow numerically. A little side note, just look at the history of our church in just the last three years, and you'll see what's happening so the church here next kept growing, and this caused problems. The local Jewish leaders who were on the other side of Christianity did not like this. They started persecuting Christians, throwing them in jail, seizing assets, and even killing them. There's a persecution against the church to try and make them stop, and look what happened in verse 1 of chapter 8. Saul approved of putting Stephen to death, and on that day a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea, Samaria, except for the apostles. The church, how many were there? Great multitudes, right? They scatter except for a few. They flee. But when they do so, they stay on destination. Even when they're growing and they get trouble, they stay on destination. And what happens as they flee? Verse 4 of chapter 8. But the believers who were scattered preached the good news about Jesus wherever they went. Not the preachers, not the apostles. Who? The normal believers went and scattered and they preached. They were so focused on their destination, they made sure to know wherever they went, they were preaching and teaching. Whether it was the waitress, if it was the camel attendant, if it, whatever it was, they had to tell the people, this is what I believe, this is what I live. While in distress for their physical life, they made sure to keep people pointed at spiritual destination. From chapter 9 and following, you're going to start moving from Peter into the life of Paul. He came to faith while persecuting, arresting, and killing Christians. And Paul thought he knew his destination. He, he was a religious Jew. He was the Pharisee of Pharisees. He kept the law perfectly, he said, until he realized it's the wrong des destination. Being religious isn't going to help. 
And just like Peter, the exact same blanks in your slides or in your bulletin, Paul changed his direction because he truly saw his destination. I purposely repeated this because we need to remember if we are not going at the right destination, we need to choose to change our direction. He went from persecuted Christians to baptizing them. He went from arresting those of faith to being arrested for his own faith. Chapter 13 then takes us to Antioch, where the believers were first called Christians. By the way, that was a slam on them at the time, but they took it as a something to celebrate. Uh, Barnabas and Paul were sent from the church to go out and spread the message of Christ to even more people, where the Holy Spirit instructed them to be set apart for the work. They started preaching and teaching. Now look what it says in chapter 13, verse 47. For the Lord gave us this command when he said, I have made you a light to the Gentiles to bring salvation to the furthest corners of the earth. We start in Jerusalem with a few people and they started growing. And you can just turn the page in your Bible and you see they grew again. Then they grew again. Then they grew again. And now Paul, uh, Barnabas and Paul are sent out by God to tell even more people beyond Jerusalem. They went to Judea, Samaria, and now we're going even to the corners of the earth. All to help people know that Jesus is their Savior. And then it happened. Gentiles began to join the, ch the church, which caused more persecution from the Jews. Yet the church continued to grow. Continued to grow as long as it was focused on destination, to grow closer to God, deeper and stronger in faith, and helping others know Jesus as their Savior. Do you notice a trend I keep saying here? Paul goes on a total of three missionary journeys. He visits various cities. In each one, he stays on his proper destination. At the end of his third missionary journey, Paul spends two years in prison. But finally, in the fall of 60 AD, he begins his journey to Rome. On the way, he was shipwrecked on the island of Malta, bitten by a poisonous snake. And yet, he stays on destination. Look how Acts closes in verses 30 and 31 of Acts 28. For the next two years, Paul lived in Rome at his own expense. He welcomed all who visited him, boldly proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ. And no one tried to stop him. Luke's account here ends in a triumph. It doesn't end with Paul's death, which occurred about 60, uh, 67 A.D. Gamaliel was right. There was nothing the Sanhedrin could do. If you look in the beginning, um, they wanted to stop Peter and John, and he said, Gamaliel stood up and said, look, if you're fighting against God, you're going to lose. And if they are going against God, they're just going to die out. So back off. Gamaliel was right. Nothing could stop this Jesus movement. But why? The church, the early church, started in a small room with a handful of people. It grew to over 3,000 in one day, and then to well over 5,000, then multitudes, and then even greater numbers. What's greater than three to 5,000? Because that, that's what it's meaning here. The church grew to become a mighty movement that, churn, that turned the world upside down, that became a mighty force. What is it that caused so many people to turn from their life to change their direction so they could go to the real destination? What is it that brought the first church to start and then explode? How many of you like to swim? Okay. okay. I, I really like swimming. I, I used to uh, race, you know, people. We'd see how long we could go, how fast, how much we'd stay underwater and stuff like that. At Lake James Christian Camp, there is an island. You can see it up there. That is... Um, good ways from the beach. It's uh, about an eighth of a mile away. Um, I swam there once from the beach. Now, I'm not going to tell you how long it took. <laughs> uh, we had a boat coming with us to make sure in case we needed help. I did not need help to get there. I got in the boat to come back, though. Um, it was a long way for me, an eighth of a mile swimming, okay? The longest distance ever swam without, swam without flippers I said swum. Um, without flippers in the open sea is 139.8 miles. Uh, Croatian national 
I'm not saying his name, swam across the Adriatic Sea in August 2006. So you can see on that red line up there where he swam. It took him 50 hours and 10 minutes. I made it to the island quicker than that. But, okay. 50 hours. But it was possible. How many of you have ever wanted to go to Hawaii or been to Hawaii? Yeah, I, I want to go, but you, I mean, okay. If you want to go to Hawaii and you want to swim to Hawaii, you have to travel 2,000 over 500 miles. It took that guy 50 hours to go 140 miles. 2,500 miles. I'm going to tell you something. You cannot swim to Hawaii. You will die. You will get tired, and you'll get eaten by a shark. Just, you're not going to make it. You can't swim to Hawaii, which means if you're going to get there, you have to choose a different vessel. You cannot trust your own strength. You're going to have to get on a boat or an airplane. That's it. You cannot get to Hawaii by human power alone. You need something bigger, something more powerful. And you cannot grow the church numerically and spiritually by human power, by human effort, or human plans. It won't work. You can grow a lot of numbers, but you cannot grow spiritually by human effort. We have a better chance of swimming to Hawaii than growing a great, godly church on our own power. So how did the first church do it? I keep saying they stayed on destination. Their destination was to grow closer to God, to have a stronger and deeper faith, and to help others come to know Jesus as their Savior. That's their destination. Ultimately, they are going to do that in heaven, where you can't get any closer to God, where you're going to have the culmination of a of strongest and deepest faith ever, and where you're going to see all the people who have already been invited to know Jesus as their Savior. But how did they do it here? How did they grow so rapidly despite hardship? How did they keep going and stay on destination? What vehicle did they use? The vehicle to get to Hawaii is either a boat or a plane. That's it. And the vehicle to grow a church is found right here in the book of Acts. All throughout this book, I don't know if you saw it, but it kept just popping up over and over. In Acts 1, chapter 5, or verse 5. John was, um, John baptized with water, but in just a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. This right here is the power, the vehicle of the first church. This is the driving force. This is the reason the first church impacted the world and is still going today. How did the first church stay on destination? Through the Holy Spirit. That is how. Many times you can see in the book of Acts, it's commonly called the, the Acts of the Apostles. That is really not a great name for this book. That description falls short of what the whole book is about. Just, just listen to these verses. They're not going to be on the screen. Acts 1 8, but you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You'll be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria to the ends of the earth. In Acts 1.16, brothers, he said, the scriptures have been fulfilled concerning Judas, who guided those who arrested Jesus. This was predicted long ago in the Old Testament by the Holy Spirit. In 2.4, everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit. In 2.33, now he exalted to the place of highest honor, talking about Jesus, at God's right hand, the Father. As he promised, he gave him the Holy Spirit to pour on us. In 4.8, then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. 4.31, after this prayer, the meeting place shook, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. In 7.55, but Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit. 8.29, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, said to Philip. 9.31, and with the encouragement of the Holy Spirit, the church began to grow in numbers. In 10.19, the Holy Spirit said to Peter. Peter. 10.44, the Holy Spirit fell upon those who were listening to the message. 11.12, do you get what's going on here? Because I have 15 more scriptures to read. 11.24, Barnabas was a man full of the Holy Spirit. In 13.2, appointed Barnabas and Saul for a special work, which I, the Holy Spirit, have called them. 13.4, <clears throat> Barnabas and Saul were sent out by the Holy Spirit. Believers were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit in 13.52. 
and 15a, God knows people's hearts and he confirmed that he accepts Gentiles by giving them the Holy Spirit. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. 1528, 16.6, the Holy Spirit had prevented us. In 19.6, then when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them. 2023, except that the Holy Spirit tells me in city after city. In 2028, so guard yourself and God's people. Feed this, feed and shepherd God's flock, His church. Purchase with His own blood over which the Holy Spirit appointed you as elders. Over 70 times, I didn't read them all. Over 70 times the Holy Spirit is specifically mentioned in the book of Acts. And it's alluded to even more than that. That's just in the book of Acts. The Holy Spirit is mentioned all over scriptures from Genesis all the way to the end in Revelation. The Holy Spirit's power is vital in the life of a Christian. It's not optional. It's not extra. The Holy Spirit transforms our hearts. Look at these scriptures. Transforms our hearts in Titus. Convicts us of sin in John. Um, the Holy Spirit is our comforter in John 14. It's our teacher and it helps us to remember. Um, also in John, it gives us power to overcome Satan. It communicates for us. It gives us spiritual gifts and the power to use them. The Holy Spirit is vital. That's a short little list. There are a lot of people who gave out lists for yesterday. Jesus gave us a list of what He's giving us. And it's all through the Holy Spirit. You look at that list, none of those. Look at that. None of those are little things like socks. Those are vital, important things. These are not bonuses. A.W. Tozer, a great theologian, said this. The Spirit-filled life is not part, not a special deluxe edition of Christianity. It is part and parcel of the total plan of God for His people. You want to have a Spirit-filled life? That's the only way God designed it. It's not the elite Christians are Spirit-filled. We tend to forget and neglect those vital parts of God in our lives. Zechariah 4.6 Then He said to me, This is what the Lord says to Zerubbabel. It is not by force nor by strength, but by my Spirit, says the Lord of Heaven's armies. Even back in Zechariah, we cannot reach it by our force or our strength, only by the Spirit. Today, many Christian churches, many Christian circles, the Holy Spirit is neglected and misunderstood. We spend more time worrying about what the church should look like physically that we no longer depend on or expect the work of the Holy Spirit to do what only He can do. We may even hope that He doesn't work because the Holy Spirit may change our plans and, and work in ways that are just uncomfortable. Another A.W. Dozer, a Tozer said this, If the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today, 95% of what we do would go on and no one would know the difference. If the Holy Spirit had been withdrawn from the New Testament church, 95% of what they did would stop, and everybody would know the difference. And I read that quote, and I had to push my keyboard up, and I backed up. Wow. So if the Holy Spirit withdrew from you, would anybody notice the Holy Spirit withdrew from me with how I live my life as a husband, father, in the community, as a preacher. Would it even change? Would your words change? Would your actions, would you treat people the same or would 90% of your life not change at all? That is a powerful statement by uh, Tozer there. So do you want to be on destination? Do you individually want to be on destination? Do we as a church want to grow closer to God, deeper, stronger in faith? <clears throat> do you want to see more and more people come to know Jesus as their Savior so we can enjoy all of eternity in heaven instead of them in hell? 
We can only do this. Well, Jesus said it in John 14, 26. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring your remembrance all the things I have said to you. Just because um, this is the last sermon of the year, the next time, I'm not going to see you for the, for the whole year. I won't see you for the rest of the year. Classic dad joke, I have to say it every year. The last sermon in our study through Acts with the theme destination doesn't mean we as a church, doesn't mean we as Christians are still are not still on destination. The ultimate destination is heaven, where we're going to be ultimately closer to God, have the fulfillment of our deep and strong faith. And we'll see everyone who has chosen Jesus as their Savior. But until we get to that destination... We have to stay in the power, the vehicle, the vessel of the Holy Spirit. Next year, we're focusing on the life of David, how he pursued God, how he pursued a deep faith, pursued a life of worship, pursued to promote the name of God, and how we, as a individuals and as a church, can pursue a quest for a godly heart like he did, just like David. But just like David, we're not going to be able to achieve those unless we tap into the Holy Spirit. All through the book of Acts, which is one of the most exciting books of the Bible, we saw adventure, we saw triumphs, we saw restoration, we saw hardships that were overcome, we saw trials that turned into victories, we saw the Holy Spirit take a ragtag group of people and exploded into the first church. It's right here in Scripture and it's right here in you and me. As long as we as a church and an individual stay on destination, the Holy Spirit is going to empower us as long as we have elders who are focused on preaching, teaching, leading the church through the power of the Holy Spirit, this church is going to grow spiritually, and spiritual growth always leads to numerical growth. As long as we have individuals who will live out their faith, speaking about Jesus throughout their lives daily, and sharing that with other people, we are going to stay on destination. We are going to stay as a church that continues to grow, focusing people on God. As long as we are focused on destination, growing closer to God, having a stronger and deeper faith, and committed to sharing others that message so they can choose Jesus as their Savior, we are going to stay on destination. And when we do that, this verse will apply to us. This is one of the best verses, I think, in Acts 3, um, in the book of Acts. And the disciples were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. Do you know why they were filled with joy? Because they were on destination. I know where I'm going. Last week, I told you about the time I went to, on Christmas Day, we left everything and we went to Grandma's. We were excited. I had joy because I knew where I was going. That is nothing compared to the joy of knowing I am on destination. And I am going to get there because Jesus gave me the Holy Spirit so he made sure I can get there. When we as a church have that, we're going to be filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. Do you know your destination? Do you truly know where you are going? Do you need to be like Peter or Paul there? And realize your destination is not the right place, so you change your direction so you can focus on God. And if you do, 1352, when the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit, we're going to have troubles this next year. We are definitely going to have troubles this next year. But we have the Holy Spirit. We're going to have problems in, in fighting at times. But we're going to focus on the Holy Spirit and let Him bring about peace. We're going to have families that break. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can bring peace. We're going to have people who lose their jobs. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, we're going to meet each other's needs. 
we're going to have to say goodbye to people for the last time on this planet. But if they've been on destination, then we get to say hello to them in eternity, full of joy and the Holy Spirit. The only way we're going to be able to go on a quest for a godly heart, the only way we're going to be able to meet that destination is through the Holy Spirit. And I want to challenge you, reread the book of Acts and see where the Holy Spirit empowered, fueled, motivated, and propelled. And God is the same yesterday, today, tomorrow. And so if the Holy Spirit can move like that in them, what can He do in us? It took about 120 in that upper room. And that's about what we've got here. And imagine if we got on destination right now. Forget St. Joe, we're going all the way to Fort Wayne. We're going to reach down to Indianapolis. We might even go all the way up to Michigan. For the joy of seeing people come to destination in Christ. Let's stand and let's pray. God, we, we thank you for sending your son on the ultimate destination of reclaiming us and bringing us into a, a right relationship with you. And I thank you that us who do not deserve it are clothed with your righteousness that are empowered by your spirit so that we can bring more and more people to knowing that you ultimately love them and died for them. Help us, God, to be that church, to be the church like Acts proclaimed, a church that's on the move, a church that is powerful, a church that is focused on you and empowered by your spirit. God, I, uh, right now I ask you to forgive us. I'm sorry where we tried to do it on our own. Where we tried to pretend to be that power. Where we tried to use our knowledge, our experiences, our resources. God, I want to lay that down and repent. Because you, you showed us that you can bring people daily. That's what it showed us in the book of Acts. You are the ones who bring salvation. You are the one who brings joy. So let us rest in what you give us. And then take that to the world. As excited as we were about Christmas gifts, help us to be truly excited about the Christ gift. His life, his death, his resurrection, and the Holy Spirit. And as we come together right now to worship you, to honor you, we want to invite you to invade us even more. To in include into us your gifts, your power, your strength, and your mind. God, let this be a joy and a cry of our hearts. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. 